Every game was a battle, it was a fight. And I had the, like, the good fortune of Captain Dunn United as well. I made my debut for Canada in 1997, uh, fulfilling a lifelong dream. I wanted to play for my country. And I was very, very fortunate. I was one of the few that got the opportunity to reach that level. I did so while playing for Darlington FC in the English third division. I can tell you about all the times I went to England and failed and didn't get a contract and had to go back to Canada with my tail between my legs. But I got my opportunity at a really low level. And I knew that once I got my foot in the door, I'd have to work to get better, 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 and improve and move to another level of the game. We failed to qualify for the Olympics in uh, 1996 in Atlanta. <clears throat> we lost out to Australia in a, a two-legged playoff. We tied the first game in Edmonton 2 2. Went to Australia to Sydney to play against them, the likes of Mark Viduka. Hayden Fox, who went on to play in the Premier League uh, in England, lost by them. The most humiliating experience in my life as a national team player. Won my first championship as a 20 year old in Montreal with Montreal Impact. Little did I know it would be another eight years until I win my next championship. I just thought as a 20 year old, this is great. Win championships, fantastic. I do this every year. Uh, I didn't, didn't really appreciate how much work goes into being successful. But I tasted it early in my career and I was very lucky. I joined Montreal from Canada's under 20 Olympic team, where I played right full back. Uh, I didn't play center back position I captain in Canada until I was 17 years old. That's the first time I played as a center back. I turned pro at the age of 16 in uh, my hometown of London, Ontario. I was really lucky. Uh, I grew up in a, in a time where we had the good fortune of having our own professional soccer league, Canadian soccer league. Um, that league um, went defunct in the early 90s, but I had three years from 16 to 18 in that league, and it made me as a player because I had to sink or swim. I was playing with and against the best player in the country at the time, Eddie Produsco, national team striker. I played against him one week, then Paul Pesci saw the next. And Alex Bunbury, and John Catliff, and Dominic Bilio. I was playing against the best, and it was sink or swim for me. And I was lucky that I had that opportunity. Because I grew up in the middle of nowhere, southwestern Ontario. I grew up on a dirt road. When I wanted to go train, I had two options to go for a run. I could go left, or I could go right. Left, it was one kilometer to the corner. Right, it was 1.4 kilometers to the corner. In between concessions was 1.4 kilometers. So if you do the math, 7.6 kilometers to run around the block. And that's what I did. Because from the age of 13 to 18, I was training in the National Training Center, trying to get better, trying to improve. I would be in a car sometimes four times a week for four hours. Two hours to practice, train for two hours, two hours home. And I did that because I had to. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have an option that was closer to home where I could get the right training, the right environment, the right coaching to get better, to improve, to fulfill my dream. I had success as a kid. I was lucky with my competitive team. We won the Ontario Cup uh, in 1986. This is the under 12 London Youth Boys. I'm not going to point myself out here. It's kind of trying to guess. Um, none of the other players on my team went on to have a career in the game at any Right. So those of you who think that winning the provincials at 12 is the pathway to start, it is Right? It's a step along the way. Soccer was my love. My, my last name is Dutch. My heritage is Dutch, um, but I'm born and bred Canadian. Uh, my brother and I would play pickup in the backyard. We'd take a hockey goal and stick it in front of the house, and we'd play one-on-one -on -one for hours. I was a multi-sport athlete. Uh, to the day I retired, I played squash to the age of 34. It was part of my training regime. Um, I, was, I wasn't blessed with Great athletic prowess, I think it's a good way to put it. Paul Jewell, my manager at Wigan, said to me once, he said, you know you can play to your 40, Jason. I said, really, you think after? He's like, yeah, if you got any slower, you're going backwards. So I played squash as part of my training regime. But in high school, I played volleyball, basketball, badminton, and squash. And I played hockey until I was 12. That man right there, green jacket, Jack McKinnon, taught me more about being a professional athlete than any coach I've ever had in my career. And I was a 10-year-old hockey player. 
He believed in me, he supported me, he taught me fundamentals. And I would go on and, and apply those same principles to everything I did not come forward. That's where it started for me. I grew up on a dirt road, middle of nowhere, southwest Ontario. Played for the Glencoe Miner Soccer Club. On a dodgy field. <laughs> No grass on that field. There was no academy. There was no professional club. There was no professional coach. Uh, Co-ed house league, right? My brother and I, two in the back in the middle. He's two years older than me, so I played out with my brother because that's what we had to do. So how do you go from that to that? I got to ask that a lot of times to people. How did you go from there to there? And if I told you the whole story, you just got you got 30 years and three minutes. <laughs> if I told you the whole story, you would not believe me about the rejection, the disappointment, the injuries, the frustration. But, but this is where it starts. You know, Paul said earlier that I come from elite sport and I love elite sport, but I also believe that we can't focus all of our resources on elite sport because every elite athlete starts here. Every single one of them. Every Christine Sinclair or Atima Hutchinson starts out there. So if we do a better job there, if we teach kids the fundamental skills they need to play the game and have fun and fall in love with it, we are by extension going to develop more players at the league level. Because ultimately for me, it's about this. We have to get kids to fall in love with the game. I was lucky. I grew up in a soccer household. My father played in, in the Netherlands before he emigrated to Canada in 1969. Uh, and I grew up playing soccer. And my first experience with the game was a really positive one. I was lucky. I was blessed. I had a little bit of um, talent. But it was a whole lot of hard work that got me to the level that I finally reached in the game. But it was because of this, I just loved to play. You know, my father was a great coach. He um, didn't have any badges, uh, didn't have any licenses. But when he started coaching me, he started taking them. And he always said that the non-sport specific coaching licenses were the best ones because it, it taught him more about uh, methodology and pedagogy and how kids learn and how they think. And he would apply his soccer knowledge with that new information to training me and developing me and my brother. He would condition games. So even in house league where I'm playing Glencoe Minor soccer, dodgy field with nets that are hung up by tape. He conditioned the game for me. He would say, you're not allowed to score more than three goals today. Or you're only allowed to score through left foot. You know, he would make the game within a game for me. So even if I was maybe ahead of that level at a time, I still fell in love with it because I had a challenge. Kids love a challenge. So that's what we have to do. And the danger when we talk about player development is that the vast majority of people are not at this level. Jesse Fleming, the Olympics bronze medal in Brazil. I was fortunate to be down there as part of John Herman's coaching staff. Uh, Jesse is the prototype for what we don't want to develop in our country. She's a phenomenal player. Technically brilliant, great athletic uh, ability. Um, just sees the game at another level. But the, the danger is when you talk about player development, people think automatically that you're going to focus on the elite. And we can't. We have to do that, and we have to do that well, but we have to focus on the grassroots level. So as I've traveled around the country, um, the last six months I've been from Victoria all the way to St. John's, all the way to, Nineveh, uh, to um, Yellowknife in Northwest Territories. Traveled an hour outside of Yellowknife to go to Bechico. Anybody been to Bechico before? <laughs> you and me, man. <laughs> um, I actually, you know, I went in the end of January, like, and people are like, why are you going to Yellowknife in January? I want to see what it really looks like in Yellowknife in January. Man, it was cold. <laughs> um, you guys probably know all about cold as well. Um, but Betchico, they just built a beautiful new facility there. Multi-sport, gymnasium, hockey rink, um, classrooms, everything for the kids there. It's brilliant. Um, but I wanted to see what it was like. And, and as I've gone around in every province and every territory, I always ask the same question. You know, what does soccer look like here? 
what successes have you had, what difficulties have you had, and how do we work together to create a vision that we can all support? Because I get asked this question a lot from people. What's your vision? How are you going to fix soccer in Canada? I'll put my hand up and say, I can't. I can't fix soccer in Canada because I'm one person and I can't coach every kid in the country. I can't run every program. I can't manage every association. I can't run every league. It's just not possible. So I can't do that, but we can. Us, you, me, everybody across the country, because we are Canadian soccer. You know, people like to push that, you know, point that finger of blame, Can Canada soccer has to do this, or Canada soccer has to do that. We are all Canada soccer, every single one of us. So how do we create a vision? What does that vision look like? And I've thought about this a lot, and I've asked people a lot of questions about what's important and what matters to them. This is what I came up with. We want to create a system of player and coach development that is unique to Canada, that allows every participant to fulfill his or her dreams within the game. So, what does that actually mean? If you want to play for Canada in the World Cup, we need to help you do that. If you want to fall in love with the game and play with your friends for the rest of your life, we need to help you do that. Because the reality is, the vast majority of the players in our country will never reach the highest level of the game. But that doesn't mean that they don't deserve the very best experience possible with soccer. So how do we do that? It starts with this. It starts with a vision. It starts with a common belief. Does anyone in the room disagree with this as a vision? Brilliant. <laughs> See, now we agree. Then the next, the next question is the hard part, which is, well, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, how do we, how do we, it sounds great, how do we do that? Well, it starts here for me. This is a picture of my whiteboard in my office at Bemo Field. Uh, on this particular day, I was working on some NCCP uh, alignment. So if you're involved in NCCP at all, you'll see the core competencies in the seven coaching outcomes. You'll probably be familiar with that. At the end of every day, I wipe the board clean, except for those seven letters, or seven words up there. The needs of the player come first. So I keep that there as a reminder that every decision that I make, that we make, in my department, has to be about that. And if it's not, there's a good chance it's the wrong decision. So that's where we start. What does the player need? And it varies depending on where they are in their development. And we have to keep that in the forefront of our minds in every decision that we make at every level of the game. Because for me, the magic happens in these three stages. That first introduction to the game has to be a positive one. Because when kids come into a sport and they have a negative experience, what do they do? They quit, right? How many of you have kids? How many of you have kids that do things all the time that they hate to do? <laughs> like chores you make them do, right? Well, let me, let me reframe that. Let me ask that a different way. Do your kids do things that they like to do more than they do things that they don't like to do? Of course, of course, right? So that's the trick for us, is how do we make it fun? That's the first, the first most important thing is, at this stage, you know, depending on where they come into the game, they gotta have fun. First and foremost, they gotta have fun. Uh, John Club, who is the grassroots manager in Alberta, has a great motto, I love this. And I've quoted John a few times on this. He says, I never want to be a child's final coach. And I love that because if you're a child's final coach, it probably means that they didn't have fun. And that means you failed as a coach. It's not about tactics, it's not about winning trophies, it's about making the game fun for every kid. Because if you do make it fun, there's a good chance they're going to be like me dressing in their full kit with their brother in the back there and kicking the ball around. It's an embarrassing photo, isn't it? That's going to come back up on me, I know it is. So, I look at where we are right now, and over the last six months, you know, people asking the question, what are you going to do, how are you going to change it, what's going to happen, what needs to be done? Well, the first thing we had to do was ask people what they're doing right now. What's working, what's not working? So, we would probably be aware. We did a survey towards the end of 2016 uh, to, to find out to what degree long-term player development, LTP, have been implemented across the country. And we came back with some really fascinating data uh, across the country, which 
is going to inform all of the decisions that we make moving forward. Buy into LTPE is really high. Around 75% of people support the principles of LTPE. They believe that the program is designed to make the game better for kids, more enjoyable for them, more fun. And there are a few caveats, and I'll talk about those in a second, but to get 75% buy-in for anyone in market research, it's pretty high. So we're happy with that. Support for LTP in rural areas is still very high. Like I said, I grew up in a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. And I know the challenges of running a rural club better than anyone because I lived that experience. Glencoe Minor Soccer Club in a town of 2,500 people, which might seem like a bustling metropolis, it isn't. Entirely volunteer run club, 100%. No professional staff, no administrators, all parents, all volunteers, all doing their very best to try and deliver soccer for the kids in their community. Registration was 20 bucks. You have a lovely Kelly Green jersey, <laughs> and it had a number on the back, and that was it. And you saw the picture, I'm not gonna bring it up again, because somebody will tweet it out, and it's gonna end badly for me. But we just played, and we had fun. And the parents, the volunteers, did the very best they could to give us the experience we needed in the game. And how many people in this room are in a very similar situation with your club? Quite a few, quite a few, right? So how do we as a country support you to give you the things you need to deliver a great soccer experience? That's our challenge. The data also came back, I'm not sure if you can read this, the two red bars are really interesting for me. They jumped off the page actually when I saw the report. We asked people to what degree they agreed with certain statements. Uh, when we asked about the removal of scores and standings, does it help kids enjoy soccer more? And does the removal of recorded scores and standings improve spectator and coach behavior? Just over 50% agreed. And they said it did, which is great. Because that means that about 50% of people support that and they believe it's working. But it also means there's about 40 odd percent that either don't agree with that or don't understand why it was done. And the challenge with scores and standings is not that it's inherently bad for kids. It isn't. Any uh, school teachers here? Right? I told this story, I saw you last night, and we were, I was gonna talk about this last night, but I was really not feeling well, and I had to, <laughs> I had to go to bed. Um, at recess, and I know that kids are a lot harder in Saskatchewan than they are in Ontario. Um, at recess, what happens when the bell goes? Doors open, kids run out in the schoolyard, they play, right? Do the adults organize them into games? No, they don't. They just play. They figure it out on their own. Do they keep score? Yeah, of course they do, right? What happens if one team is winning by a lot and hammering the other team? What do the kids do? Switch their teams up. Of course they do, right? Because kids want to compete. They want it to be fair, and they want to compete. They want to challenge themselves. Right? So, when we talk about the removal of scores and standings, it's not that they're bad for kids, it's that they're actually bad for adults. You know, the adults, we get carried away with the competition. We get carried away with, my kids gotta win. And we make decisions that are not in the child's best interest, not in the player's best interest. We don't put their needs ahead of our own. Because, as coaches, as parents, we want to be able to say that our team won. It's more about us living vicariously to our kids than about them having fun and enjoying the game. So we've got work to do. We have to educate people about this. We've got work to do in terms of spreading that understanding across the country of what it is we're trying to do with kids through those first three stages of LTP. For me, it's all about developing fundamental skills. I was gonna talk about other countries and what they do, because I hear this a lot as well. We need to do what they do in Germany. Or we need to do what they do in Spain, Netherlands, Iceland, Belgium, whatever. You name the country. There's loads of them out there, loads of examples. And I was listening to an interview the other day with the technical director of the Croatian Federation. And he was talking about the importance of fundamental skills. You cannot ask a child to compete 
unless they have the tools with which to compete. That was his premise. That the core principle of their philosophy is the stable perfection of technique at a younger age. And what that means is, you can't ask a child to play a game of soccer until they learn how to run with the ball, and kick the ball, and pass the ball, and receive the ball. If we're going to ask them to compete before they have the skills needed to do so, it's going to be organized chaos. Who's watched a, a young group of players anywhere under the age of 10? It's like a swarm of bees, isn't it? You throw the ball in it, it's like they just move around en masse around the field, right? Because they just get so focused on the ball, they don't really understand the game. So we've got to take those principles from those other countries, those really developed soccer worlds, and we have to apply them to Canada. How do we do that? That's a big challenge. Because we have this mindset that we've got to win. And it's us, the adults, the guardians of the game that are doing it. We ask the technical directors, what percentage of players are being selected for programs based on skill? As young as seven, 30% admit that they're selecting players based on skill. What does skill look like at seven? Does anybody know? You don't fall on your face. You don't fall on your face. You, know, you put one foot in front of the other. More often than not, skill at this level is simple uh, physical maturation. You know, the child that is physically a little bit more mature than their peers. There's no indicator whatsoever of future greatness, and no one in the world can tell you what 7, 8, 10, 12, 14 year old is going to quote unquote make it. And if they tell you they can, they're lying. 30% of our technical directors admit to selecting players based on skill as young as 7. That number rises to 55% by the age of 8 and 9. 66% by the age of 10 and 11. We have to change this practice. It makes no sense. Because what it does is it encourages parents to go younger and younger and younger in the solution of trying to find that magic ticket. Early sports specialization in soccer is not recommended. You should be trying to promote multi-sport participation with your kids as much as you can. I could stack documents up this high of all of the research that's been done in this area about the benefit of multi-sport participation and the dangers of early specialization. And when I say early specialization, I mean focusing on one sport and one sport alone to the exclusion of all other activities. That's what early sport specialization is. When I was a kid, I played soccer in the summer and hockey in the winter. And I did that up to the age of 12. And I loved the end of each season because it meant I could go and do something different and have that enthusiasm and that fun. You know, you look at, um, you look at other sports, a lot of research in this. Hockey's a really interesting one. A lot of kids uh, that make it to the NHL come from really small towns. And they're multi-sport athletes. You know, they get a lot of ice time, they get, they get to play other sports this summer, because no kids get cut. In a small town, whoever you got is who you got. And I think in a lot of ways, some of the small towns figure it out better than the big cities, because they actually group players based on ability, rather than based on age. So if you have a younger player who is a little bit more advanced, they can play out. I did that when I was a kid in soccer and hockey. They helped me. But this early sports specialization, this craziness that is seeping into our game has to stop because there's no evidence whatsoever to support that going younger and younger and younger actually works. So we have to change that. So how are we going to do that? There's a couple of important initiatives that we're, we're implementing in Canada Soccer that's going to impact what you do at the grassroots level. The first is the Canada Soccer Club Licensing Program. What we're trying to do is capture everyone who delivers soccer in our country in the same program. So, if your organization exists and registers your players with the governing body, the Saskatchewan Soccer, you will be a member of the club licensing program. That will be level one. If you aspire to reach a higher level in the program, Saskatchewan Soccer will work with you as an organization to help you meet certain objectives. 
So if you aspire to be a really well-run community club, you might be able to reach level two. If you're a really aspirational organization that wants to go to a higher level again, you might reach level three. Level four will be for the high performance leagues that we're setting up across the country. But there is a place for everyone in this system. And it's not just about your business status, so it's not just for nonprofits. So if you deliver soccer in any way, shape, or form, there will be a role for you. Because I want to work with people that want the game to grow. And from a technical perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, from a governance perspective, an administrative perspective, we want to work with people that want to help the game get better. And that's really where the club licensing program comes into play. Coach education is a huge piece of this for me. As I've traveled around the country, every province tells the same story. We struggle to get coaches. We struggle to train coaches. We struggle to educate coaches. How many people in this room are volunteer coaches? Loads. Right? How many people here feel that they need more resources to help them? Loads. Right? One of the challenges that we have in our country, there's multiple challenges, one's climate, but the biggest one for me is geography. Our, our country is enormous. It's huge. Just ask my wife, because <laughs> I've been traveling around the country for the last six months. It's massive. You know, even driving within a province is a, is a real challenge. So asking parents to give up a weekend to go and sit in a classroom and go on pitch and get a coaching qualification isn't the best use of their time. So what can we do differently to help them? One, we need to develop online resources. So our community stream courses, once we have an online learning management system that's nationally based so that everyone in the country can access it, some of our content will be put online so that you don't have to spend a whole weekend taking a community stream course. Now you can do some of that learning at home, on your own, when you have time, when it's convenient for you. You'll have access to curriculum. You'll have access to videos of demonstration sessions. Because I don't know about you guys, but I hate reading PDFs. I don't log onto websites to scroll through PDFs anymore. I want access to relevant information that is right at hand. I want to watch a video on my phone when I'm sitting at, at, at work or I'm sitting at home on my way to practice. I want access to things that are relevant to me. So for most people working with grassroots players, they need to see video of good practice so that they can then replicate that with their kids. We're creating new coaching courses. 85% of our members in Canada are under the age of 18. We've never had a competency-based coaching course for coaching young kids. So 85% of our coaches are taking qualifications that are not really relevant to them. So if you're working with talented young players and you take a B license or an A license course, there is zero content on those courses that is age and stage specific. There is zero content on those courses that is gender specific. So when you're coaching a 12 year old girl, it's a heck of a lot different than coaching a 20-year-old man. I always say that a 10-year-old is not a mini 20-year-old, and we can't treat them that way. So we're developing two courses. The first is called the Children's License. It will be aimed at coaches working with players between the ages of 5 and 12. The first three stages of long-term player development. It will have multiple components to it. Some will be delivered entirely online by subject matter experts, and we'll cover such things as social emotional development, cognitive development, physical development, and building relationships. And that's gonna be relevant to that age bracket. So that you as a, co a coach can get a better understanding of how your kids think. Because ultimately that's what coaching is. It's understanding the kids, and the teachers are all nodding their heads because they know this better than anyone. The best coaches that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years at the grassroots level, the vast majority of them are also elementary school teachers. Because they have an understanding that, you know what, kids think differently than adults. And we as a coach, and I don't even like to use the word coach when I talk about working with young kids, you're a soccer teacher. That's what you are. So to do that, you have to understand your subject. And you have to understand your student and how they think. 
So that's going to be a component of it. Respect in sport is going to be a component of it. And I know that that's not a problem here because it's already mandatory. We want to do as much as we possibly can to safeguard the well-being of our kids. And if that means we have to take an online course to do so, I'm in favor of it. Uh, first aid will be a part of it because, all, again, it's about the, the, uh, the safety and protection of our kids. If they have an injury, we need to know how to deal with it, how to treat it. There will also be practical modules that revolve around working with kids in a session, planning and practice. A lot of the NCCP stuff is very, very good in that respect. Um, but what we'll do is we'll train learning facilitators across the province, and we'll work with Saskatchewan Soccer to identify who those people will be, so that they can deliver the practical modules on a schedule that works for everybody in Saskatchewan. Because one of the biggest challenges we have in coach education is saying to people, you've got to give up this week of the year and go to this place to take a course. I struggled with it. I couldn't do it with my schedule. So we have to work with our coaches to try and find a way to get the knowledge to them in a way that they can digest it and then put it into practice. So that's the first course. The second course is going to be a youth license, which is going to be aimed towards coaches working with players between the age of 13 and 17. And again, it will follow the same modules as the children's license, but be relevant to what those kids need. Anybody here have teenagers? You guys will know that they're different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, how, do you, how do you talk to a teenager? I'm lucky because my kids are great. My wife's done a remarkable job raising them. Um, but there's days when I look at my daughter and I go, where are you from? <laughs> you know, so you've got to understand that as a coach. You've know? you got to understand things like self-esteem and what a child's going through and how that affects their performance in a training session or a game. If we don't have that information as a coach, if we don't understand that, we can't do a great job of delivering sessions that are going to keep kids engaged in the game. So these are the directions that we're going. And this is a big piece for me. Age and stage appropriate training in games. You know, you look at 11 v 11 full field soccer, and I often wonder why there's such a big push uh, from parents to get their kids playing 11 v 11. I had the info with Paul, we had a number of changes that we made to our program there. We called in the parents of all the academy players into a room to talk about some of the changes they were making. And it was really geared towards being LTP compliant and going to more small site game formats and training formats. And I remember one of the questions from one of the mothers, she said, put her hand up, she said, when are you going to teach my kid to play full field 11 v 11 real soccer? And I said, well, we're going to do that. Bear in mind, her son was nine. Um, we're going to do that. But first, we're going to start with 1v1. And then we're going to progress to 2v2 and 3v3 so that your child gets more touches on the ball. Because when they play 11v11 in a full field 90-minute game, they're lucky if they touch the ball for 90 seconds. When you play small field, they get exponentially more touches on the ball. And that's what we want to encourage. So that's why we have to educate coaches on how to do that. When I was, uh, and I won't say which province I was in, but I was in one of the provinces um, in late last year. And I was watching a community session be delivered. And the coach had nine players there. And he set up a drill where he had a box, about 15 by 15, he had a player standing on each corner and they had a line of five players. And they would pass the ball to the first guy, and then the guy would turn and pass to the second guy, and they'd go around, and they'd follow their pass. And, and I was standing there watching it, thinking to myself, this cannot be fun for these kids. It's just a boring passing drill. And I was standing with the coach educator from that province, and I said to him, this is where the coach needs to understand that putting two goals and going 4v4 with a neutral player is a much better experience to recreate that street soccer. You know, you always hear about this. Kids don't play enough on their own anymore. They don't play outside enough on their own. They don't have that, you know, all the kids go to the park and play. And that maybe is a societal challenge. So if it's a societal challenge and the kids are not doing that on their own, we've got to recreate those environments ourselves in our training sessions. So rather than doing a boring passing drill, 
can't we have a game where the kids can play? And this is why I'm a big supporter of futsal, because I look at our climate, it's a huge challenge in this country. Uh, some parts of our country you can't play outside because the weather is just not conducive to that. Yet every community in Canada has an educational facility, elementary school, high school, pretty much all those organizations have gymnasiums. Can we not utilize those facilities? Because that's another big challenge for us is infrastructure. We don't have a lot of covered full field indoor facilities. You know, the Rolls Royce, the, you know, the, the best of the best. But we do have gymnasiums. Can we utilize that infrastructure far better than we are right now? Because there's a lot of correlation between the two games. Futsal is a sport unto its own, but there's a lot of transferability of skills between the two programs, for sure. And we better do a better job of creating those environments. So if it's in gymnasium, you've got 10, 15, 20 kids, can you break them up into small side of games, play across the gym, have two games for 3v3 going on at the same time? I guarantee you, your kids are going to love that. We did it in Oakville. It's one of the first things we did. We put in place a club-wide futsal program for all of our competitive and advanced players. And it costs next to nothing because the gym space isn't that expensive. It's certainly a lot cheaper than a full field indoor facility. And the kids loved it. And I said to the coaches, I don't want you to coach. I want you to balance the teams. Let the kids figure it out on their own. Let them play. That's your job as a coach. Let them play. The kids loved it. So can we do that? Can we find ways to make the kids have fun? Because that's what it's about. That's where it starts. I was 12 in 1986 when we won the Ontario Cup. But it wasn't the Ontario Cup that inspired me. It was watching Canada play in Mexico the World Cup. That event, it just lit something in my mind. I wanted to play for Canada and I wanted to get to the World Cup. And ultimately I failed. I had three cracks at it, the qualifying, failed each time. I failed a lot in my life. But I was still able to achieve some of my dreams because I kept going and I had an inspiration. And I'm living proof that it doesn't matter where you're from, that if you put in the hard work and you have people that support you and believe in you, coaches, parents, those are hugely important roles. If you have people that believe in you, anything's possible. So I'm excited to talk with everybody today and tomorrow about some of the challenges you have in Saskatchewan and how we can help you. Again, new coaching courses, Canada Soccer Club licensing program, online resources to give coaches what they need to do a better job of helping their kids play the game and follow up with soccer.